Terrific. Good morning. Uh, first off, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here with you today, and I want to thank you all for coming back from the break. Um, every day, I try to learn something new, and if it's a successful day, then I learn something early in the morning. And today, uh, I actually learned something very early from Marco in the previous discussion, so I'm very, very happy about that. And what I learned is that Polar has been in the wearable devices market for more than 30 years, which is amazing. 30 years, but uh, this session is here in 2015. So why is that? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that and uh, chat about various functions and ideas around connectivity in the wearable space. And not surprisingly, I'm not really going to say anything that, that diverges very much from what Pankaj said for Qualcomm. I think that our uh, view of the space is aligned um, very closely, but maybe my take will be a little bit different from the point of view of approaching it from the, point, the connectivity side, so maybe from the bottom looking up. And so the presentation today is talking about opportunities and challenges in contacting wearable devices. And hopefully, you know, I'll say something that makes you think a little bit about some of the challenges and some of the approaches that uh, Broadcom is taking and that you might take. Um, who here has heard of, of Broadcom? Yeah, okay. Yeah, some. Um, yeah, we've been in the news uh, quite a bit over the last week, and, and we're not going to talk anything about that today. <laughs> um, legal talk, um, read this at your leisure next time. So, again, it's interesting. You know, Polar has been out there, and other, other vendors have been out there for many, many years. So, why is now, in 2015, the time of the Internet of Things. Why not last year? Why not five years ago? Why all the, the, the hype, to use the H word? And really, it's, it's a convergence of a lot of different effects. And really, the, the key catalyst for the market, for the wearable market, for the IoT market, has been the growth of the smartphone. And what's really changed is that everybody carries a phone. We did a survey earlier, and basically 100% of people carry smartphones. And everybody's comfortable with the smartphone, everybody's comfortable with the connectivity of the smartphone, and they want to get more use out of that. They want to use it to run their life. And that effect and that move to the smartphone revolution is really driving this push to wearable devices. So why is this happening? Well, there's a massive number, uncountable number of devices and ideas. I'm from San Francisco, and in San Francisco, if you have a kitchen table and you can get some Kickstarter money, then you're, you're in business. You can do a wearable device, and that's, that's not hyperbole. I mean, that's um, Pebble, which is one of the top wearable device companies. That's exactly their story. They, they, sat around a kitchen table, got some Kickstarter money, and they're in the wearable device business very successfully. There are literally thousands of players, you know, thousands of people in this room, thousands of players in the market. And it's a very interesting convergence of different kinds of companies. You have the very, very small Kickstarter guys. You have the electronics consumer device companies that are using the advantages that they have in understanding their markets to move into the wearable device market and the big names there. You have companies that are very specialized, like Polar, on wearable devices and they bring their specialization to making those devices very useful. And you have companies that have maybe been successful in other markets that are repositioning themselves. You know, companies like, like TomTom, where um, they've been successful in another segment of consumer electronics, and they're using that as a basis to move to wearable devices. Ultimately, it's a greenfield market. It's brand new, there's no monopolized players, there's no mo monopolized markets. It's wide open for companies with design expertise and good ideas to enter. And the barriers to entry are really low because of this. And so there's just a huge opportunity for innovation and getting out into the market. And you see that. You see that with so many players, so many different kinds of devices, so many different takes. So 
so, you know, everybody, every, every, every market guy brings his numbers. And I, I like these numbers because they're interesting in a sense. I actually, if you look closely, if you have very good eyes, you can see that these are market data. These were, were forecasts from 2013. So these are a little bit old that I've copied over. And when we started using these last year, it was because the numbers were so huge and impressive. We were trying to convince people that this effect was happening. So these were big numbers that, that astounded people and wowed them. And what we see now in 2015 is these numbers are probably conservative. You know, probably we're going to see a lot more than 70 million devices sold by 2017. And I think looking into the wearable market, you know, obviously a big game changer for everybody, I think, in a positive way, is the announcement of uh, the Apple Watch device. And I think that's a huge validation of the market. I think that it's exposed it to a lot of people who might not necessarily have been consumers of wearable devices before, but now they see that. They see it as, as connecting to their phone. I think that's obviously good for them and it's good for other companies in the space in that it's really kick-started this whole effect and it's, it's brought wearables to the mainstream. So with so many different thousands of kinds of devices, we've tried to bring some order to the chaos by segmenting wearable devices a little bit. Some of the, again, our viewpoint is from the point of view of the connectivity. And so, you know, we're looking at it from the connectivity looking up. And there are a wide range of devices, but we're really focused at this point with the Broadcom's connectivity on kind of three different classes. So you have your basic devices, you know, no user display, just a simple band. And these are really focused on smartphone connectivity. And they're essentially, they're, they're impulse buys. They're very inexpensive consumer devices. They're by the checkout at the store. You see one, it's very inexpensive, and, and you, you grab one. And these are typically based on real-time operating systems, very simple, very high performance, um, designed to do one or two functions um, extremely efficiently. Then in the mid category, you have devices that are more focused on fitness and sports. And some of these are RTOS based, but now you move into the domain of open OSs like Android Wear. Um, often these have low-cost displays, little LCD displays or something, so that you can interact with it locally. And um, these have wider connectivity options that are really focused more on connecting to the home network or the hotspot. And then finally, you know, kind of the exciting part of the market now where, you know, the most Money is applied by the OEMs, and so there's the greatest opportunity for innovation, and also, frankly, the greatest opportunity for uh, misinnovation, is in the high-end devices, so the smart devices. And these are typically always connected. Um, they're based on open OSs. They have very sophisticated multimedia capabilities. Um, most cases, they have touch screens for interacting with them. And these will bring different kinds of connectivity options that befit their always-on characteristics. So, from the point of view of a company like Broadcom, we approach each of these in slightly different ways. And one of the tenets of what we're trying to do is you apply the connectivity, the right connectivity solution for the problem that you're trying to solve. So, at the low end, for the, the, the basic bands, the connectivity is going to be Bluetooth or BLE, Bluetooth Smart. Um, as you move up in the complexity chain, then you're going to start to see Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi Bluetooth combos. Um, moving into the middle, then you get a little bit more innovation and GPS becomes very important. We'll talk a little bit more about GPS later so, and sensor hubs. And some interesting ideas with NFC. 
Um, and we'll also talk more about provisioning and connecting the devices, which is one of the bigger challenges. You know, and the, this talk is talking about challenges. Um, wireless charging. Um, I really want to focus a little bit on wireless charging because I think this is a very important topic. Um, there's nothing more awkward about using a wearable device and having to get down on your knees and plug it into your plug on the baseband and you have wall warts everywhere in your house and um, worst of all, you forget to plug it in. And if you forget to plug it in, then it's going to stop. I mean, some of these high-end devices, they have limited battery life, and it becomes a big problem. And if you forget to plug it in and your watch stops three times, it's going to go in the drawer. You're going to stop using it. And so talking about challenges, battery life is obviously a huge challenge and connecting this. Ultimately, we see a vision of where wireless charging really solved this problem. Wireless charging, once it rolls out into the ecosystem, can essentially give you infinite battery life. Because you go home, you have a charging pad, you throw it on the charging pad. Moving forward, you're going to see it start to appear in restaurants and coffee shops and places like that. So you go to your local Starbucks or your McDonald's, you throw your device on the table for 10 or 15 minutes. You go to your office, it's going to be an office furniture. So ultimately, if it's unobtrusive and always available to charge, you essentially have infinite battery life. And this is a great vision for the wearable space. Um, battery technology is not going to keep up as fast as the electronics draw the current. So finding a solution to this problem, ultimately, this may get solved with things like energy harvesting, you know, solar or motion. In the meantime, we see wireless charging as a really key solution to moving to the next generation of wearable devices. And this is something that Broadcom is really pushing forward aggressively. Um, and then finally, you know, as you get more into the SOC platforms, very, very complex CPUs, um, you have wearable devices that have more compute powder than PCs had five years ago. I mean, it's amazing. And this brings in functionalities like multimedia and modem capabilities. So designing these devices, and I'm sure Marco's going to agree with this, I mean, I th we see kind of three key tenets that really lead to a successful design effort. Um, security is huge, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. But um, security is something that everybody's concerned about. When there are security breaches, it's, it's a newsworthy event. It winds up on CNN International, and it creates great concern about these devices. Everybody's worried, oh, if I gain five pounds, this is going to be on the internet. So security is a huge issue. And luckily, all the connectivity chips that we make have security baked in. So it's there. The security is an integral part of every connectivity chip we make. We just have to make sure that we work with you as designers to enable that, to make it easy to use, to make it an integral part of the experience. Reliability. Um, we're all technical people. We're all PC users. I think PC users have a certain expectation of how much reliability they can expect. You know, and every once in a while things hang up. You have to smack it upside the head. This is just part of the, the PC experience that people have grown to expect. But moving into consumer devices, that's not the case. It's not targeting technical people anymore. It's targeting the mothers of technical people. It's targeting, quote, unquote, real people. And the devices have to be consistent and reliable, no matter what you do. If your, your device reboots or it stops, into the drawer it goes. Huge, huge issue. And finally, interoperability. And interoperability, I think that this is one of the major, major issues. And I'd say for any wearable device, when you buy that wearable device, the most important time in the consumer's history with that device is the first 30 minutes. 
If you take that device, you unpack it, you put it on your wrist, you start to configure it, if you cannot get that interoperable and talking to your device within 30 minutes, it's going to go back to the store. People will say, it's broken, it's too frustrating, I can't use this. And then Marco has to sell the same device twice, and poor doesn't make very much money. So interoperability is, is absolutely key. And this is something where Broadcom, as a supplier, we're in four out of five of the smartphones. I mean, this is something that we really bring kind of natively, and it's something that our customers value very much. So where are we? I mean, now we're kind of two or three or four or 30 years into the, uh, the smartphone re revolution or in, into the wearable device revolution. So what we find is this year, I mean, obviously, you know, we have a room full of people here. Wearable devices are critical mass and awareness and OEM focus. Everybody sees the opportunity. Everybody wants to get into the opportunity. Last Christmas, fitness trackers were huge sellers. Every store that people went to, they were sold out. They became the ultimate impulse buy. But the challenge is, you know, people buy them, they put them on. Are they still going to be using those by this summer? And selling the devices is one thing. Getting them running and configured is another thing. But keeping them in use, keep, keeping, keeping people engaged is a huge challenge. And ultimately, people want to see these devices be used. They want to see people engaged with them. They want to see them step up to a more sophisticated device, ultimately. And ultimately, the smartwatches and the fitness bands, all these other devices have really been seen as logical extensions of the smartphone. People, they have their smartphone. And now they're ready to step up and buy another device that talks to their smartphone. It makes sense for them. So from the point of view of, of marketing, you know, we did a good job collectively, all of us. Um, the first generation devices. The market is really being defined by what works. And these are consumer devices. And the challenge of consumer devices, especially expensive ones. So imagine a smartwatch where you're asking people to put down several hundred dollars of their hard-earned money. And in order for somebody to do that, a fitness band is an impulse buy. Just buy it. Okay, it's $20. For a smartwatch, it's a fashion statement. It's a big expenditure. It's something that people are putting down real money. And ultimately, the feature set of those devices have to be 100% perfect. If they're 90% perfect, people won't buy them. They'll fail. That's how people buy consumer devices. And you know, I like to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a marketing director. And I think one of the most dangerous things in technology is a bunch of marketing guys on a whiteboard. Because what they're going to do is go to that whiteboard and put down 65 usage cases for the device that they're trying to make. And ultimately, people don't buy devices that way. They don't buy devices choosing three of the features out of the 65 that they're going to like. They want those three features to be exactly what they want. And that's what they're going to choose. And ultimately, we're getting there. You know, this is an iterative process. We succeed by failing. You know, people build things, it's not quite right. Then they make changes, 2.0, not quite right. 3.0, not quite right. 4.0 flies off the shelves. And we're in that process now. We're balancing features to get the, the feature set exactly right for what people are going to buy. And this is especially challenging when you have so much power available. I mean, if you have the power of a supercomputer and a device, that's scary, because you're going to over-engineer it. You're going to tend to put in too much stuff. You're going to overwhelm the consumer. You're going to scare people. And so less is more. You know, one of the challenges, less is more. Doing things the right way is better than putting everything that you can think of into it and letting the consumer figure it out. And we're in that process now. The devices that makers are making now are infinitely better 
than the devices that were out there one or two years ago. And so the second generation were really standing on the shoulders of the pioneers, the first generation devices. Um, GNSS GPS, I mean, one thing about GPS and tracking location-based services is accuracy is key. If you run the same loop every day, and it tells you Monday that you ran five miles, and then Tuesday you ran three miles, and Wednesday you ran seven miles, you know, people are gonna lose confidence in the device, into the, into the drawer. Accuracy is key, and so that's an area where companies like Broadcom are really focusing on improving the user experience. If you do the same thing every day, you want the same result every day. At the same time, GPS is very, very powerful CPU. And you want to use that. You want to make use of that and make it available for other uses. You can do distributed processing to drive down the current usage in the device. And again, battery life is key. Everything about battery life. And with a sensor hub that's always on, you can now do things like voice-based processing, voice-based command processing. And that's huge, you know, these have touch screens, but unless you have very tiny, pointy little fingers, they're very, very hard to use. But if you have something that's always on for processing, then it can, can process voice commands. Very, very simple user interface. And so this is kind of the future of where the GPS, GNSS chips are going. And really, what everybody's targeting is optimizing the usage case set so that you can take advantage of the connectivity you have for logical processing. So do things in the most efficient manner to maximize the customer experience and minimize battery drain. Okay, so considerations when you're adding connectivity to your device. What do you have to think about? Well, obviously, there are traditional considerations that have always been a part of every design that we've been making since portable devices have been part of our lives, from the PC age to the phone age. Size, smaller is better. Um, battery life, obviously, really pounding the drum on battery life. Cost. Um, nobody ever says that our, our, our chips are too cheap and they'd like to pay us more, so cost is very important. And then for wearables, thermal considerations. You know, you can't have a device that's so powerful that it heats up and burns a hole in people's wrists. So in this space where people are actually wearing things on their body, thermal becomes extremely, extremely important. And then there are specialized design considerations. You know, how much connectivity is enough? You know, is BLE enough to make the device useful? And I, I share Marco's fondness for BLE. I think Bluetooth, um, the potential is expanding exponentially, and it's going to bring amazing capabilities in having devices communicate with each other to give more and more functionality. But how much connectivity is too much? If you have a basic design device, do you need it to be on all the, all the time? Do you need 3G? Do you need LTE? Or is that too much? Do you need these devices to be talking all the time and draining your battery life? Probably not in many cases. And then finally, ensuring interoperability in a smartphone world that's rapidly changing. And this is a huge issue because how often do you change your phone? You know, every one year, every two years. When you get your new phone, you don't want to have to go through another frustrating process of not having it pair with your device. You don't want to have to do firmware upgrades. You don't want to have to throw it away. So in IoT in general, and in this space in particular, these things have to be engineered to last for a very long time, much longer than, in many cases, the electronics companies are used to. And this is an overarching challenge for, for the IoT space. And it's one that applies very, very heavily to, to the smart, uh, wearable space as well. 
what about cases where you have it connected to your smartphone, but you don't have your smartphone with you? You know, this, this young lady here is, is running, and she doesn't have any pockets. So maybe she doesn't, she doesn't want to carry her smartphone with her. But at the same time, she wants the device to be useful, do local analytics, and have a seamless connectivity experience even when the phone isn't with her. And it has to be designed in for that. I mean, that's a big part of the considerations for making the devices useful in the usage models that, that are intended. So local analytics becomes really important, doing more locally so that you have less dependency on the phone, less dependency on the cloud. The ease of use is really defined by the connectivity. I mean, ultimately, the device is a device. I mean, what people are using are the, the fantastic features that Polar and the other companies design in. But the user experience is really defined by the connectivity. And if the connectivity doesn't work, like I said, if they can't get a consumer can't get it working in the first 30 minutes, the device is going to go back to the shop. So Ease of provisioning and setup is really key. And a lot of this is design, a lot of this is test. And it's very exciting. A lot of companies focus 95% of their test effort on once the thing is up and working and connected. And they under-test on the provisioning and the compatibility. But again, this is, from the user's point of view, probably the most important time in their experience with the device. So, us as developers, we really have to focus on ease of provisioning, ease of setup, make it logical, make it simple, make it intuitive. Um, ease of use, obviously. You know, make it as easy to use as possible, integrate the connectivity with the device so that it works smoothly. You don't want to have to do 12 button pushes to be able to use the connectivity. You want it to be baked in very seamlessly. And then finally, intuitive and smooth app integration. I mean, ultimately, where people are interfacing with the devices in most cases is on the app side, not on the device side. And having the connectivity baked in not only to the device but also into the app is a big part of the usage experience. And really focusing on these three areas when you design in your connectivity is going to help the customers and their customers have a much, much better successful experience. Ultimately, low power sensor-based is, is a huge part of where things are going. More and more sensors, more data, more analytics, more processing. Combining the input from different sensors to come up with new and important information to tell you um, not only some number, but that you're healthy, you know. You want to use the different sensor information not to get some random number, as Marco was, was talking about, but to get useful components that, that give you qualitative information. Ultimately, all this stress strains the battery life. It's a huge issue. So for the latest designs, the latest technology, the impact in battery life is going to be relatively small. Without the latest technology, you know, you're going to be plugged in all the time. So this is an area where, again, intelligent design is very, very critical. And then finally, I want to finish up because I think from the point of view of the wearables market, security and the various components of security is really one of the most important determinants. Everybody is worried about security. And in many cases, with health data, you have to be. There are legal ramifications to security. But security actually has a few different components. So there's security, which is the, the hardware encryption, which is an integral part of everything that we build. So this is one area of security versus privacy. And privacy is, you know, I'm not concerned about the data getting hacked from your device to your phone to the cloud. But end-to-end -end control of that data is very, very critical. Um, this is where people get scared and worried. 
And then finally, trust. So once the data is up there, who has access to that data and who's combining it in different ways to understand more about you than you want to know? And ultimately, even though issues of trust are important, they have an image of security. And all these things work together hand in hand to help us to grow the market and to help our customers be comfortable with what we're doing. So to conclude, the connectivity really defines the user experience. And so you want to add the Goldilocks, not too little, not too much, just enough connectivity. And you want it to be integrated intuitively and reliably and in a way that protects the consumer's data and instills trust. And ultimately, everything that we do, interoperability, is the killer app. So I want to thank you very much for your time.